Welcome to the Sexy Freedom Media Podcast, friends. Today's podcast is part two of a three-part series of podcasts I'm doing on the subject of grief and loss. If you haven't listened to part one, I'd suggest going back to episode 89 to hear any part you may have missed about my recent journey with grief. Just a quick note, this podcast is sponsored by Sexy Freedom LLC and the best-selling book, Nothing Sexier Than Freedom by Helen Edwards, available on Amazon and Barnes & Nobles, coming soon to Audible. All right, friends, thanks so much for joining me today. So in part one, you heard some intimate details about my recent months spent with my mother in her final days. Since my mother's passing in January, 2022, I've, I have had an outpouring of love and support from people all over the world who watched our videos of my mother's final days. One of the things that hit me the hardest was learning a very close friend of mine was going through the same thing with her own mother, except because of the pandemic, she was kept apart from her mom. My heart literally wept for her and for anybody who was going through that situation. People from all over sent me messages of their own experience with their loved ones in their final days, people losing their parents and even parents who were in their final days that had to say goodbye to their children. Many people shared their stories of feeling heartbreak after losing their parents and still feeling that same heartbreak years later. According to all the specialists, there are five stages of grief. The five stages of grief are denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. Having gone through tremendous grief numerous times now, can I attest to these stages? I often ask myself. Honestly, I'm still not sure I can. In 2017, when I received the horrible news of my brother taking his life, I spent months trying to understand my emotions. As someone who has dedicated almost two decades of myself to self-improvement and learning about emotional mastery, I had decided to turn my pain into power. That was the path that I had chosen after learning about my brother's suicide. When speaking with my sisters, I shared that both the news of our father and brother's death felt like a Band-Aid had quickly got ripped off, but mom's terminal cancer felt like a Band-Aid that was slowly being pulled off, creating like this long lasting, slow, deep pain. However, there is no comparison of deep agonizing pain in the world of grief. There are only different stories and different paths that we all go on, even the path to healing. This is mine. Learning how to caregive for mom wasn't something I foresaw coming in my future so soon. In fact, I don't think many of us think about these things because we are so caught up in our daily lives, you know, everything that's going on with work, our families, relationships, that sometimes we forget that death will come for each of us. And the question I think many of us need to ask ourselves is, are we prepared? I remember having to raise money for my father's funeral because there were no funds to lay him to rest. Funerals cost money. My father died broke. There was no preparation or funds left behind for his children, just a lot of chaos and grief left, be left behind for all who loved him. A lot of fighting was going on amongst the family, who gets what stuff. It just felt like a vulture-centered world and I wanted no part of that at that time. When my brother passed, his stuff had already been gone through by some of his friends who said that he promised him things. That's another example of, you know, people coming and just cleaning house because of something that he told them without anything in writing. It felt a little bit strange to go pick up his stuff and there were things that we were like, well, where's this, where's that? Um, if you've gone through the grief of a loved one and know what I'm talking about, then you know the feeling behind that. 
My mom would always have open conversations about what is prepared for us when she passes. She wanted to pass on her 40 acres to her children and grandchildren and talked about an insurance plan in place for her kids to divide. Thankfully, she was prepared and her final days were covered. However, her insurance policy in 40 acres was not distributed to us, but it was distributed to her beneficiary, which was my stepdad. And in some cases, we've heard of families kind of going at each other's throat based on what he said, she said. But my stepdad was her person, was her husband. And we honored this because we honored mom. I share this because there are three different scenarios here which involve plans and preparations after someone's death. If you've been through the final days and death of a loved one, you know that grief can cause things to get really ugly and sticky, especially over money and stuff. But it doesn't have to be ugly and sticky. My sisters and I agreed this is not going to go down that way, not on our watch. We weren't paid to care for mom and we weren't after her stuff. We are her daughters and this is what you do when you love someone, you care for them. Throughout mom's final days, we did everything in our power to honor her. Honor meant something to my mom. It's a word we were raised with. Did we always honor her? No, but as we've grown, we've learned more about honor and our mother deserved nothing less than honor. My mom loved my stepdad. He was her person. Whatever he wanted, she wanted. Even as much as we got frustrated with him, we honored him because we honored her. We love him and still have a relationship with him, but grief did try to divide us all. I write this because this is a true testament of how great love is and can be. In honor of my mother, love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices within the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. 1 Corinthians 13, 4, 8. My mom embodied love. You can ask anyone who shared time with my mom during her final days. She never once felt like a victim, never once put anyone down or made anyone feel unloved. She was cheerful, happy to see anyone who visited and kept everyone's emotions steady. She was truly the anchor of us all during this very hard time. I'd have private conversations with her, telling her that I was angry because she was good. She was kind. There were people who were wretched in this world and they get to live. I felt it very unfair. My grief began the moment I found out about my, mom, my mom's cancer. Anger began to develop. I would find myself angry at those who called themselves my closest friends, who didn't even show up at my mom's celebration of life who weren't reaching out to me when I needed to hear a voice of comfort or some kind of support. I was angry because my mom had been a huge part of my life, part of my circle. And I mean, we created memories together and I just wasn't seeing a lot of them showing up for me. I found myself angry at my family for not being there when my mom would be drop her world to be with them in the past. I found myself angry at myself for not knowing about my mom's cancer earlier, had I paid more attention. Maybe I could have did something sooner. I just felt so much anger, so much blaming. And I started to feel it becoming something that was festering within myself. And this is where emotional mastery comes and plays a big part in my life. And I'm really thankful that I've done the work 
throughout the last two decades because I recognized it and knew I had to communicate my feelings to everyone I felt anger towards. Because I knew it wasn't them I was angry at. No one caused this grief. I really wasn't angry at them. I was heartbroken and angry and angry at the results of everything that was happening because of cancer. I'm honestly, truly thankful for my friends and my family who heard me tell them that I was angry, who listened to me. And instead of getting defensive back or judging me or shutting off and closing themselves up, they loved me right where I was with kind words and affirmed their support for me. And some of them even said, I just didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to be there for you because I'd never been through this. And it started making sense to me. Like if we open that communication up, we find out that nobody's a mind reader. We had to just talk and say, hey, I just need to be heard on both ends of the relationships. Mom would say, whoever shows up at her, relation, her celebration of life shows. Whoever doesn't, doesn't. No one is obligated to do anything. People have their own lives. It doesn't mean people care less if they don't show. People can love from wherever they are. And that in itself is a beautiful thing. My mom was really wise. And I would spend time with the sunrise each morning reflecting on her words, asking the big universe for strength. Every day, I would tell my mom about my emotional roller coaster and dealing with my anger and how I'm learning to manage it during all that was going on. She would tell me, you know what, Nan? I raised some strong girls. <sighs> yes, yes, she did. Each of my sisters, Melissa, Kathy, and Mitzi are all so much like our mother. We are all strong-willed, direct, bold, wildly adventurous, loving, and definitely stubborn. I wrote in my book, Nothing Sexier Than Freedom, how I had watched my mother care for her own mother, my grandmother, in her final days. Ironically, they both passed in the same house. I often think of my mom's overflowing, whelming, overflowing, how am I, Excuse me. I'm trying to think of the best way to say this. I often think of her overflowing of compassion that she gave to others, that this is why it flowed back to her in abundance. Throughout caring for mom, I couldn't help but think about all the sick and disabled who had caregivers of their own who were strangers caring for them, or the ones who have people who just go in and do their jobs and leave. See, my mother was a caregiver and I'd been able to go to work with her many times and meet some of her clients. She was always so fun and nice. All her clients loved her. Mom also would share stories with us of caregivers who were cold and bitter. Some who would get fired for being abusive or for theft. Even caregivers in hospital hospices were cold and nasty. The thought of so many out there not receiving the same love and honor that my mom was getting made me sad. But at the same time, my heart opened up for those who were out there caregiving and spreading love and joy to those who were in their final days. Those caregivers, nurses, and hospice, hospice care workers need some big rewards because it's truly honorable to share love and joy with someone in their hardest moments in life. When I say my mother taught us the wisdom of life and now the wisdom of death, she surely did. It's been almost two months since my mom's passing. I am still crying every day and that is okay. A good friend of mine sent me a message that she wakes up in a funk sometimes and she gets frustrated about it. I told her I get it. I wake up every day sad, every day. But I wake up, take a breath, and know the choice is mine. The choice to get my ass up, work out, and put a smile on my face. The choice is mine. This doesn't mean I'm getting past grief, 
but rather living alongside it and still choosing to love myself. I've found a new freedom in this choice. It's allowed me to let go of the idea of fixing myself or trying to fix anyone else. The wisdom of my mother's final days has shown me that we each have our own personal journey and also an unknowing number of days to experience this journey. I've learned to let go of so many attachments I've had to obligations and assumptions I didn't even know I had until I was going through this. Like filling obligations to friends and, and assuming those obligations back to me. I've realized those who choose your friendship and to intentionally water that friendship do so at their own desire. Obligations are to be eliminated because that is not freedom in the friendship. That is not love. That is not a healthy relationship. There is this gift of bliss when you are able to feel secure in relationships that are based on love and not fear. I've received many messages of people who are struggling to find healing after losing someone they loved. I get it. My heart goes out to you. I understand not everyone has a circle of love and support around them, but that can change. And that change is really up to you to make. Every day, the process of grief tends to have many thoughts go to memories where I find myself feeling guilty, sad, and angry. My thoughts begin to run rampage sometimes, but recognizing my thoughts and acknowledging my pain allows me to stand in my strength. Yes, I am sad. Yes, I am heartbroken. Yes, there are many who struggle and some days I do too. But I also recognize and acknowledge that I am the daughter of an indigenous Spanish queen, a daughter of a feminist warrior, a daughter of a fucking long distance badass biker, a daughter of God fearing and God loving free spirited woman. My mother raised me to be, to be strong, stand strong. Even when I want to weep all day in bed, I can feel her heart within me, pushing me back up. Just because I lost someone and the pain is often numbing and horrendous doesn't give me permission to be an asshole. As I've learned this, <laughs> when I spiraled out of control one night, repeatedly calling my sister a bitch, the next day feeling remorseful and apologetic, my sister standing in the same strength of mom forgave me, loved me, and laughed with me the next day. Is my anger gone? Hell no, I wish it was. And I'm working towards, you know, healing that anger inside of me. I still have days when I'm angry, when I want to yell and scream. I have days when I feel numb and want to drink myself to sleep, just so I don't have to face the darkness of my soul, the grief, just so I don't have to face or accept that my mom is gone. I've stepped back from much of my work and shifted my energy because of this. I know I need me more than anything right now. Just today, I walked through the house and wanted to just start packing my shit and throw shit across the house. I wanted to scream and break things. I wanted to delete all my social media and stop all of my projects I worked so hard towards. Thankfully, there is a caregiver also in my head, my higher conscious self who is loving, patient and kind and was like, nope, uh-uh, not doing that. Let it pass, let it pass. This feeling will pass. Breathe through it, hold on. Like my mother would say, hold your horses. <laughs> I often have to check my emotions. Did something trigger this besides grief? Where am, where am I in my female, female cycle with my hormones? How is my health and well-being today? These are questions I ask myself. I always do an assessment of myself when I feel myself about to self-destruct. I refuse to become destructive. I know exactly where that leads me. 
Last time I let grief overtake me, I found myself in jail. Yeah, I can't allow that to happen again. Y'all don't allow that to happen. Self-destruction is something you pay for financially and it can break a home, it can break yourself. And sometimes you'll find yourself years later paying for it. My heart is broken, but that doesn't mean my soul has to break too. I can hear mom saying now, don't worry about me, baby girl. I'm flying high with Richard now. Richard's my baby brother. We are good. You got to let this anger go and you got to live your life, mija. Mom was my biggest cheerleader in all my crazy entrepreneur endeavors. And she always got excited to hear about my travels around the world. She was a wild one. Oh, she was a wild one. <laughs> always going, doing, and living life. She was super adventurous, probably where her kids get it from. She had even planned to come to Wyoming again, to spend a couple of months with Rob and I right before the news of her cancer. She had future plans. I'm gonna pause right here because I gotta say this. You know, you gotta ask yourself this. What would you do if you only had one more year with your loved one? What would you do if you only had six or even three more months with them? Because the harsh reality is some of us will actually have to face these questions. And the worst part of it is none of us know if that hand will be ours until we get that news. You know, my advice is don't wait to get that news, friends. With all the positive quotes, positive vibes, and pressing joy in this world, also remember life is both fragile and precious. I've been thinking a lot about gratitude lately, a lot of gratitude and the overwhelming amount of gratitude I'm starting to feel for people who are in my life, who have chosen to be in my circle, who've chosen to water the relationships with me. Think about the ones in your circle. Who are they? They're investing their energy in you, energy that can go into other things, other people, other investments. Today, take some time to tell someone you love them. Maybe send them a surprise gift or letter or a message sharing your appreciation for them. Show some kindness without expectations. Show some gratitude and appreciation for them today. Maybe dance with your loved ones in the kitchen. Surprise someone with flowers. Do something daring you've always wanted to do, even if it's just dancing in front of the camera. Even if it's speaking up and being vulnerable about something that means something to you, give your permission, give yourself permission to live alive today, right now, in this moment. Sometimes we all are waiting. I just need to wait till I get my check. I just need to wait till after the 15th or after the 24th or whatever date it is. I just need to wait until this month slows down for me. What are we waiting for? You know, a lot of people say, I don't have any regrets because everything that happened in my life has brought me to this point. And you know what? Maybe I might be the first person that admits this, maybe I'm not, but I do have regrets because there's nothing in my mind that tells me I wouldn't came to this place any other way, but there is actually. The more I think about it, I'm, I'm a strong woman. I know I would have built myself up no matter which route I took, but my regrets are that I didn't spend time when I felt the calling to spend time with somebody I loved. I could have spent more time with my father. I could have spent more time with my brother. I could have spent more time with my mom, but I waited. I waited and I put excuses on my plate, a plate full of excuses. I'm not doing that no more. 
I told myself, no mas, no mas. If you feel silly for telling somebody how much you love them, then that's that's work that needs to get done still. You know, if you feel like you don't have the time, we're gonna we're gonna make time, woman. Okay, like this is ooh, my higher conscious is like, girl, queen, listen up, baby doll. <laughs> I'm in control now, and gratitude's taking over. Love is taking over. Love, love is taking over. It's okay to not be okay, but also lift yourself back up in time and time again, no matter how many times you fall, no matter how many times you tear up, it's okay to smile alongside pain. It's okay to be human and make mistakes along the journey. It's okay to not know all the answers in life. And it's okay to step back to reevaluate your life and to shift your energy back to you. I'm a coach. I'm an author. I'm a speaker. I'm a podcaster. I'm a retreat leader. But you know what else? I'm human like you. And I know that it's okay to be vulnerable. It's okay to be human. It's okay to cry, it's okay to laugh, it's okay to dance, it's okay to scream. If you're out there grieving, my heart goes out to you. Let's be kind to ourselves. Let's be patient with ourselves and heal softly. I love you. Thank you so much for listening to part two of this three-part podcast series on grief and loss. If you'd like to send us a note of your own journey or give a shout out to a loved one, you can email us at sexyfreedomnow at gmail.com. Follow, subscribe, and leave us a review by clicking the link in the show notes. Stay tuned for part three. Also, thank you for all the continued support and reviews, friends. I'd like to give a special shout out to all my love and to all my friends out there, specifically Rob and my son, who's been so supportive. A shout out to my friend and my mom's friend, Darlene. You are a great friend to my mother and to her daughters. Shout out to my big queen energy girls, Danita, Shreddy, Jessica, M, Michelle, Leah, Cass, Liz, Yolanda, Rachel, BJ, Delina, January. Thank you so much for being my circle of queens who lift me up. Beth, thank you so much for being there. Thank you so much for anyone who I haven't mentioned that, that reached out to me. Uh, Adriana, uh, Sarah, thank you so much. Um, Thank you, thank you, thank you. Glenda, thank you. Uh, I'm just thinking of names, anybody I may have forgotten. Um, thank you so much. And to my warrior siblings, Melissa, Kathy, Shark, I love you all so much. Thank you for listening. Till next time, I hear.